Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. And we're talking about the names of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And uh, today, we're, uh, last week was on the uh, oil of gladness. And we enjoyed that last week. Praise God. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews the 10th chapter. We had a good service in Winston-Salem this morning. We're having good services over there. Praise the Lord. Some, uh, some of the folks are coming over this, supposed to come over and eat with us. Hallelujah. We'll see what happens. Hallelujah. There was a rebellion in the, the ranks. Somebody was trying to break the rebellion. They were, somebody didn't want to come. I don't want to go. We said, you know, then somebody came in. You got to go. So they're, they're, they're breaking the rebellion. They're coming. Hallelujah. Amen. How many love Jesus? Amen. All the time. All right, praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 says, um, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye um, that ye should be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the cut blood of the covenant wherewith he is a sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now, we're not, on, we're not teaching on the first part of that verse. Aren't you glad? Y'all hear? All right, but we're after that part. That part has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The Holy Ghost is also called the Spirit of grace. Everybody say the Spirit of grace. Now, the word grace comes from the Greek charis, and it, can, it means a variety of things. It does not simply mean only solely uh, uh, hardcore, unmerited, undeserved favor. As a matter of fact, uh, it, the, the word carries a broader meaning, uh, uh, graciousness, uh, the influence, uh, acceptance, uh, favor. You know, there's, there's numerous words that that, that word uh, conveys in meaning, but it doesn't, it's not limited to the, uh, the, the mostly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, most people always want to say, um, you know, that it's, it's undeserved, unmerited favor, which I think is just, it really limits the meaning of the word, or, or the word charis. Um, it, it, it's divine influence upon the heart. Not necessarily, that's not always favor. See, we kind of think of favor is with us, other people. You know, God's favor is on us and we have favor with other people. Or we got undeserved, unmerited favor. God did something for us undeservedly and unmeritedly. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's, an error, there's an element of truth in that. But the fact is God influences our heart with his spirit. Amen. He presses upon us by the Holy Ghost. And, you know, to, to lead us and to guide us by his spirit, praise God. Uh, makes it, it benefit, favor, gift, graciousness, joy, liberality, pleasure, thankfulness, thanksworthy. This, this, that word Chris means all those things. So let's not just limit it to undeserved, unmerited favor for the word grace. Then we, we, kind, of, we kind of limit what God's saying. You know, there's places where that, that wouldn't even work, Okay. Uh, undeserved, unmerited favor. Remember Paul said, you know, that when I'm weak and I'm strong, he said, therefore I'll rejoice in my infirmities that the, you know, the power of God may rest upon me. Amen. You know, Jesus said to him, when you, you know, uh, your, my grace is sufficient for you. My favors, well, no, he didn't need favor. He needed strength. And Paul went on and said in that passage, talking about what we call Paul's thorn, he said, I'll rejoice when I'm weak that the power of God may rest upon me. So grace in that moment in time was not favor. It was power. So there was strengthening grace. You know, talk, there's places where Paul talks about his ministry and calls it this grace. He's not talking about favor. He's talking about, he's talking about ministry. It's ministry grace. There's places where grace is referred to as money. So there's giving grace. Amen. Here, so the Holy Ghost is the spirit of grace. He presses upon influence upon our hearts. He presses upon us the, will, you know, the, the knowledge of the will of God. He presses upon us to follow after God. Can somebody say glory to God? He's he endeavors daily and, and, and consistently to lead us into the will and purposes of God. Hallelujah. So it is the role and the work of the Holy Spirit you know, as the Spirit of grace to administer and apply, and apply the grace of God in all of its facets in our life. Hallelujah. 
Can you say amen to that? And, um, and so, not just so we know about it in a legal sense, you know, well, I, I know that I'm legally saved, but he wants us to have an experiential knowledge of things. He wants us to walk in what the Greek as epinosis, the experiential, experiential knowledge of God. And the grace of God is applied to our life. The spirit of grace works to come bring us into a knowledge of the will, the purposes, the plans, the desires, and the benefits of God for your life. Amen. He's there to do those things in us. And he is not simply there to have, you know, make you favorable. Now, on the other side of that, he's not simply there so that, you know, I'm under grace, I can do whatever I want to do. That's just the, some of the dumbest teaching I've ever heard in the body of Christ in my life. You just can't do whatever you want to do and it's okay with God. <clears throat> That's not what the spirit of grace does. Remember, if you'll study Jesus, Jesus said that the, the Holy Ghost would bring to our remembrance whatever he taught. So if he's the spirit of grace, in, in, in his gifting and in his influence upon your heart, he's influencing the teachings of Jesus on your heart. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so we need to be aware of these things and not become uh, uh, caught up with, you know, facets, or as the Bible says, every wind of doctrine, you know, they, they, they blow through. Some doctors blow in, blow up, and blow out. And leave a path of destruction with them on the, on the way in and out. So what, what do we do? We know that the Holy Ghost, as the Spirit of grace, he's, is he to, here, here to administer and apply God's grace to our life. Thank God for God's grace. Thank God for his gifting. Thank God for his acceptance. Thank God for his, for his graciousness. Thank God he's influencing us. Man, I'm going to tell you, something, something's influencing you all the time. How many, ever, how many have been sitting down watching TV and minding your own business? And a commercial came up for some restaurant. And they put, you know, the biggest, juiciest T-bone steak you ever seen up on that television screen. I mean, and you can hear, they got sound effects. It's sizzling. You got butter on it and butter's rolling off of it. Got a baked potato loaded up with sour cream and chives and bacon bits and cheese. Glory be to God forever. Got some, got some honey yeast rolls. Mm. I said, can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And uh, as I look at that commercial, my stomach said, what did it say? It said, get on up from there. You know what happens? All of a sudden, you're, what's happening? That commercial is influencing you to want to do what? Get up from that couch, and you don't have to be a couch potato. You want to go be a restaurant potato. You want to get in there and get a hold of that steak. Amen? You mean you walk out, I want what they had on television. Of course, you find out you don't get what they had on television. That was for television. But you're being influenced. You're right down the interstate, you know, and they got, uh, look, Coca-Cola does it with the trucks. You're riding down the road, there's a glass with ice in it, and, the, and, and they got the carbonated bubbles popping all off of it. What are you thinking? Where's the next exit? You know? McDonald's got the fries and the Coke up there. You're thinking, get me to Mickey D's. You know? You're thinking, I say, what's happening? You are being influenced. There's influence pressing upon you to do something. See, influence comes on you. So he's the spirit of grace. He is a spirit of influence who comes on your life to press upon you. Now, not, not force, but to press upon you the, in, in, in a guiding and tender, caring way to press upon you to walk out the will of God. See, it's God's grace that leads you to desire, to walk and the purposes of God. See, God has a plan for your life. Say, God has a plan for my life. Say, God has benefits for my life. God has desires for my life. Oh, glory be to God. I said, somebody say, glory be to God. And the spirit of grace. See, God just didn't kick you out there and say, figure it out. Oh, thank God. I said, thank God. Aren't you glad your parents didn't throw you in the car and said, figure out how to drive? Because there may not have been a car left by the time you got done. Some of you got your license and you still don't hardly have a car left because of what you've been doing. Anyway, I'm just going to say. Cass said it wasn't his fault. 
He had a wreck. Well, he, 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 was in, he was involved in an accident this week. Somebody rear-ended the car behind him, and they totaled his car because it ran him into the car in front of him, and they totaled it, you know, just sitting at a stoplight. What was that? Probably the person was texting and doing something because they were distracted and never stopped. Boom. Right in the four, they messed up three cars, and they got charged with the destruction of three, car, four cars, including their own. So bless their darling hearts and stupid heads. So he said he wasn't his fault. He had a wreck. But aren't you glad your parents didn't just throw you on the car and say, go figure it out? Now, some of you might have thought you could do it, but you know, you know better than that. It takes us a lot to drive an automobile, especially in the old day. How many remember when you had to use both feet? Yeah, yeah I remember when you had to use both feet. What do you mean? Well, you had, to, you had to use your clutch. Yeah, remember you had to change gears. You had to use your, Now, my first car was a Falcon, 64 Ford Falcon. Now, don't laugh at that because that was a chassis they put the Mustang on. First Mustang was built on the Falcon chassis, you know. That's why I had the three on the column. And I had a three on the column. First, second, third, reverse. Hallelujah. Three on the column. But you had to drive with your clutch. You had to, when every time you changed gears, you had to use your left foot, take your foot off the gas, you know, all this kind of stuff. When you got on a hill and broke, you know, had your brakes, you're holding your brake with the right foot, you're holding the clutch with the left foot. Then when you got ready to take off, you had to let the clutch out a little bit, take your foot off, put it on the gas, all that. Somebody remember all that stuff? Yeah, you just didn't jump in the car and figure out how to do that all by yourself. That took some work. And, and, and you had to use your left foot to dim the lights. Y'all remember that? You had a little dimmer switch on the floor. You had to click them. All right. See, you, you know, but somebody taught you how to do I mean, I was taught how to drive. Okay? Went to driver's ed. They taught you how to drive. And, you know, and you had, you had, you had, most of the time you had to learn how to back then, learn how to drive with a straight shift. They wouldn't let you learn how, how, how to drive a straight shift. You know? Some people are going, what's a straight shift? I'm not talking about the little automatic manual where you kind of flip it back, like, you know, this little thing they got now. We don't have a clutch. I'm talking about having the clutch. Anybody ever pop, break your clutch? I did. My Fiat Spider broke it twice. Anyway, it's because I drove hard. Anyway, I had to be taught. And you, had, you know, you had to have the influence of knowledge upon your life to be able to do that. And see, God's spirit does not want you just kind of wandering through life. God has no desire for you to wander through life and try to figure out how to live for him, how to figure out what his will is. He presses upon you with his spirit. Now, when I say press, I'm not talking about driving and making you. He, he, he influences you. Just like the TV commercial influences you for the steak, just like when you sit down in the restaurant and they got the cherry cheesecake up there with about 25,000 cherries up there and juice running all down it. And you, I mean, it's about this tall and about this big. And when it comes out, it's about this big and about this tall. Got one cherry on it. But anyway, the little sign makes you want to, be, to have that cherry cheesecake. They don't, you know, in some restaurants, they have, they have artificial desserts made up that look like the real thing sitting out there on a tray when you walk in. All that is designed to do is to influence in you, <clears throat> to make a decision to purchase it. The Holy, the Spirit of grace influences you to make a decision to do God's will, to follow after God, to do what God wants you to do. He's ever active in your life and influencing you with his presence, glory to God. Okay, and to bring you into God's will for your life. I'm kind of taking this side of the word charis and getting on the influence side. He is a spirit of grace, spirit of influence. His influ now remember this, that God's work in your life is always for your good. Amen. Honey, I'm telling you, get, going out and having your, your loved one killed in a car wreck is not good. Amen. God doesn't kill loved ones. Amen. God doesn't kill your dog or your cat. He didn't run over you with a tractor trailer. Or come on now. Amen. I mean, he's not, he's not breaking your leg so he can teach you a lesson. That's not God. God's a good God. Amen. I say God is a good God. Amen. Did you know the Bible says every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father above in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning? Hallelujah. So the spirit of grace is here to influence us with the goodness of God and the mercies of God. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad that I woke up this morning to, a, to, the, to the knowledge that I have a good God and his spirit is pressing upon me good things. He's leading me into good places. Hallelujah. Are you here? You gone home? No, you can't be gone home yet. We ain't eating yet. Amen. Amen. So the spirit of grace, the spirit of God is also known as the spirit of grace, the spirit of caress, influence, acceptance, favor, graciousness. Aren't you glad we have a gracious God? God, you know, God doesn't hate you. Somebody say that. God doesn't hate me. Say God's not angry with me. My, my, my. He's the spirit of grace. 
Look at uh, Hebrews. The, oh, where is it? I was just there. I'm trying to think. Hebrews, the, uh, the, let us come boldly chapter. Is that Hebrews, guys? Thank you. I, was, I kept thinking 19. I kept looking for things with 19 in them. Okay. Back up just a little bit to verse 12. For the word of God is quick or alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sun, soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the faults and intents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked, open unto him, uh, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, seeing then... We have a great high priest. Everybody say, we have a great high priest. Great high what kind of high priest do we have? We have a great high priest. Jesus is not a mean high priest. He's a great high priest. Amen? Hallelujah. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now, the same Greek word for confession. Confession is translated profession. So he's a, he is the, uh, um, the, let us hold fast our confession or profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now, the word infirmities in the Greek does not mean sicknesses. It means weaknesses. Okay? So we don't have a, we don't have, now King James says a little bit backwards in, in doing this. We don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, we have a high priest who is touched by the feeling of our weaknesses. Okay, as double negatives cancel out, so it kind of turns it back around. But anyway, <clears throat> we have not an high priest who cannot be touched. Thank God we don't have a high priest who's not concerned about us. I'm glad he is concerned about us. I'm glad he is in tune with us. I'm glad the spirit of grace is upon us. Can you say amen? But was in all points tempted like as we yet without sin. Let us therefore. Now why? We have a high priest. Now remember, the Holy Spirit, being the spirit of grace, influences the presses upon us. He presses upon us in a way so that when we, we look at Jesus, we're not coming up here going, I'm a dog, I'm sorry, I'm rotten, I've messed up again, I'm no good. God is not condemning you. Now quite frankly, if you see in your own heart, will condemn you. You don't need God to do it. As a matter of fact, God made provision that if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Amen? Amen? Amen. First John uh, says, says to us, he said, if our heart condemn us not, then we have we confidence toward God. Thank God we can have confidence toward God. Why? How can we have our heart not condemn us? Not condemn us? Well, what if I've messed up? Thank God there's something called the throne of grace. The Spirit of God will lead you to God's presence, lead you to the place of reconciliation. Let us therefore, verse 16, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Maybe you want to mark out in your side margin there, this is not the throne of merit. It is the throne of grace. Not the throne of merit. You do not earn access to the throne of grace. You do not purchase access to the throne of grace. You do not deserve the throne of grace. You get there because God has made provision to the throne of grace where you can come boldly. When? Well, that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The spirit of grace is always leading us to the places where we walk in God's mercies, we walk in God's grace, we walk in God's blessing. Amen. Now, let me say this. We've, talk, we've talked a lot about, you know, not, not misusing the grace of God. <clears throat> but we're not talking about, we're, you know, Paul says, hey, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We're not to continue in sin that grace may abound. We're not to continue doing the things. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I have a hard time with any Christian who's, who's gotten his life right with the Lord, come to the things of God, been born again, wanting. Now, listen, I don't say you won't, but I say wanting to live in the, in the things of this world, live in sin, live in, in rebellion against the commandments of God. Live, I, can't have, I have a hard time with any Christian who lo, who's born of God wanting. Now, that doesn't mean you don't, don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean you don't mess up. I'm, talk, I'm talking about having a desire. 
desiring to live that way. I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with your testimony if that's what you want to do. That went over big. Because I believe if you're born again, you love God, you're, you're, you, know, you, you don't want to dishonor the Father. You don't want to displease the Father. You don't want to walk in lasciviousness or lasciviousness. Remember the Bible says in Jude, he says they've entered in and turned the grace of God uh, uh, into lasciviousness. Lasciviousness, King James, lasciviousness. You know, living, living ungodly. See, if the Spirit of grace is pressing upon your heart, he's not pressing upon you that it's okay to go out and fornicate. He's not pressing upon you that it's okay to steal. He's not pressing upon you that it's okay to shoot up and smoke and get high and get drunk and get, you know, he's not pressing. What's he doing? Maybe you're, maybe you've done that, but he's pressing upon you to walk away from that. He's pressing upon you to walk with God. He's pressing upon you to live like Jesus wants you to live. He's pressing upon you to put those things away. You know, lay aside the weights and the sin that do so easily beset you and run with patience the race that is set before you. That's what he's pressing upon you. He's not pressing upon you that it's okay to do whatever you want to do and get by with it. So the Holy Ghost is going to come on you. If you're born again, the Spirit of Grace is there to influence you. He's going to come up there and he's going to gently nudge you, say, don't do that. He's going to nudge you and say, let's go with the Father. There's better things over in the Spirit. You don't know how I feel when I get high. Yeah, I do. Anytime you get intoxicated or inebriated outside the, you know, in, in the natural with anything, alcohol, dope, whatever, it's all doing the same thing. It's, it is cutting you off from control of your senses so that you can just kind of feel relaxed or whatever. And the whole thing is, that's, God doesn't want you cut off. God, God made you spirit, soul, and body. He wants you to walk it out with the spirit of God on the inside, with the, with the, with the inebriation of the Holy Ghost, as it were, where you're in tune. With it. And see, what, here's, the, here's the thing. How many know that when you get drunk or whatever in the natural, it, 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 it messes you up? Some of you've woke up with cotton mouth before. Some of you've killed some brown, brain cells. Some of you've shot up before and didn't, you know, didn't know what was going to happen. But see, when you get inebriated with God, you don't lose contact with God. You get closer to God. Things are brought under control with God. How many know when you get, you get high and stuff, you lose control? Usually you lose control, of, uh, of control between, your spirit, between you and your body. You lose control. Your body, you start doing stuff you wouldn't normally do. Now, some folks are mean drunks. They go slapping people around. Some folk, folks are crying drunks. They get, they get over there and start crying, whining and crying about everything because they can't be, let their emotions out. They get disconnected. But see, when you get, when you get uh, in tune with God, when you get filled up with God, when you get inebriated, as it were, as, as Ephesians 5 says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Hallelujah. When you get in that place, you don't get, get disconnected. You get closer with God. You don't lose control of some, as it were, of things. You become more in control. Your body becomes more subjected to your spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you say amen? And see, the spirit of grace is influencing you, impressing upon you to walk in the grace of God, to walk in the influence of God, so that you're not going out here doing things you shouldn't be doing, but you're doing what God wants you to do. God wants you to do things. God has a plan for you. I said God has a plan for you. I'll say it again. God has a plan for you. Amen. Hallelujah. The next name is found in Zechariah chapter 12 called the spirit of grace and supplication. So not only is his influence, the, the, this here is that the, he, um, he, he is the operation of grace that leads us to pray in that supplication in deep prayer. Zechariah chapter 12. Hallelujah. Verse 10. And I will pour out in the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look unto me whom they uh, look upon me whom they have pierced, Jesus, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Now that was written 1,500 years before crucifixion was a um, form of capital punishment by the Roman Empire. So this is a prophecy concerning the crucifixion of Jesus. But notice they will have the spirit of grace and supplication. You know, the Holy Ghost can come on you and, 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 um, and give you urges. 
See, it takes, it takes a working of grace to, to supplicate. See, we can pray things out on our own. There are certain types of prayer we can just pray out because we want to pray. We can pray the prayer of believing and receiving, often called the prayer of faith. We can pray the prayer of binding and loosing. You know, where you bind things on earth and bind devils, bind things operating. We can pray the prayer of thanksgiving. But there are a couple of types of prayer that really take a move of the, of the spirit of grace on our life to enter into fully. That is intercession and supplication. Because when you start standing in the gap for others in that way, when that fervency of that comes, that's by the Holy Ghost. I said that's by the Holy Ghost. Now you can learn to be more in tune with that as you grow with God. Or you can, you know, you're less in tune with it when you're younger. You become more in tune as you develop that. But the spirit of grace and supplication comes on you and helps you pray for other people. Can you say amen? To pray in intensity. Look at Romans to the 8th chapter. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not how to pray as we ought. <laughs> See, this is the Spirit of grace and supplication. You don't know how to pray as you ought. There are places, and listen, even people who pray a lot, they get to places they just, they know they need the Holy Ghost to join up with them, to take hold with them. Amen? So the, so the Spirit himself um, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Hallelujah. Are you here? You're going home. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of God, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Back up here in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth us. The word helpeth comes from three Greek words that means to take hold together with, against. Takes hold together with, against. The Spirit takes hold with you to help you or to take hold with you against. Now, like, uh, uh, let's see here. Um, maybe I've got a big old chest of drawers at the house, and I need help moving it. So I call Nathan in. Now let me say this. He takes hold together with, against the weight of that. He doesn't take hold with, against, and pushes it the opposite way of what I'm trying to push it. That's, that's working countermanding what we're trying to do. Now we've done that before. We had to stop. And look, this is what we need to do. Okay? He's wanting to do it one way. I want to do it another. And, you know, I'm the big dog. Okay? Since I'm the big dog, it goes my way. Here's how we're going to do it, son. He has, to, he has to back down because he thinks he's got it, he's got it figured out. You know, so we're going to do it this way. Okay? But, you know, the Holy Ghost comes to take hold together with us against our infirmities. For we know not how to pray as we ought. See, in order to enter into, into places of intercession and supplication, we need the spirit of grace and supplication to come on us. Amen? Move us into that place to take hold with us and bring us into that place where we can, we can accomplish things in the spirit. Amen? Oh, when what wonderful things can we accomplish? Praise God. Amen. You know, he, the Holy Spirit gets involved in our prayer life. We, he, we ought to have him involved in our prayer life. Amen. Amen? I, I don't have anything wrong. I don't have any problems with books on how to pray, you know, which, how to pray when you do this and how to pray when you do that. But I'll tell you what, you need the Holy Ghost involved. Amen. You need the Spirit of God working with you. You need the Spirit of God taking hold with you against things. You need the Spirit of God to manifest himself and to, and to lead and to guide you, praise God. I mean, when there's things you don't know how to pray. How many have ever tried to pray for something you didn't know how to pray for? It? Amen. I just don't know how to pray. Anybody ever been there? You think you know, and then you start praying. I remember Lynn Hammond one time. Uh, she was telling, she was at a prayer conference, and she was sharing this, this, uh, this story or testimony, or whatever you want to call it. She was sharing it. She said, you know, uh, she'd been praying about something one time, and there was something going on. She was praying about it, and praying about it, and praying about it. She said she went months praying about it. And she just finally got frustrated. So she called up Dad Hagen, and said, Dad, said, uh, I need some help. And he said, well, what is it? He said, well, look, I've been, I've been praying about this now for some time. Been praying about this for months. Said, and I just can't get an answer. He said, oh, he said, that's because the Spirit isn't taking hold with you. She said, what? He said, the Holy Ghost isn't taking hold with you about that. You're trying to pray it out in one direction, and he won't, and you're, and he, he won't hook up with you because that's not the way he's trying to go. You're going to have to let him take hold with you. Amen? Meaning you're going to help, you're gonna have to get in there and let him kind of work in there and lead and guide you. And Remember, he's the Spirit of influence. The Spirit of grace is that. He's that Spirit of influence. He'll, he'll influence you a long ways. You know, we get, we get to praying sometimes. We'll start praying. I, I've seen people pray things out until they believe certain things were the will of God and they weren't. 
had a situation a number of years ago with somebody, and they, they told us. They said, you know, we, we, I prayed this and 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 prayed this until finally I believed it was what we were supposed to do, and God moved supernaturally and arrested them, and they went, oh, you know, that wasn't God at all. We just kept praying. We prayed it so hard and prayed it so hard in that direction that by the time we, we got there, we couldn't let it go. We thought it was all God. See, God, well, because the Spirit won't take it. He'll leave you alone. And if you won't listen to him, he'll leave you alone. Look at me. If you won't listen, he'll leave you alone. And you'll be praying, thinking, yo, I got God on this. Woo, I got the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he ain't talking to you anymore. So you're, now you're going to start going by your feelings. Because you're praying something you want, and you ain't getting a no. Woo, yeah, I got, I got it. Yeah, hallelujah. But if you're going to let the Holy Ghost, the spirit of influence come on you and help you because you don't know how to pray as you ought. A lot of times we pray selfishly. Now, let's face it. It's one, you know, it's, you know, you might ride by a house. And I, I claim that I prayed about, I prayed about the Lord said it was my house. Did he say that or did you say that? Now, let me, let me share something with you. A number of years ago, we were, um, we were, we, were want, we were wanting to move out of the house that we were in, and we started looking around. We, we had gone into the neighborhood where our, our current home is and looked at that home, and, ah, no, nah, it's too expensive. You kind of went, it's too expensive. It really did. That's, that's really, that, 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 because we didn't have the, we, we didn't meet the criteria to get it. And so we just forgot about it, for, you know, and then we went and looked at another house in another neighborhood. It's not a bad neighborhood. It's a nice neighborhood, but it went, and, and, and we were going to build a house. And we, I'm telling you, oh, yeah, Hallelujah. We're going to get this house. It was, it was been a nice house. That's, that's not the point, okay? It's not that, not, not that it was a horrible house and, you know, that if you don't have the same kind of house I got, you're, you're missing God. It was that we got, the, we got to building that house, and we got to a certain point where our house wasn't selling. I couldn't hardly give the thing away. I couldn't, dra I mean, I couldn't drag them in off the streets to come look at it. Open houses, open houses, open houses. Could not get them in there. And then if they did come in there, they wanted to lowball the thing out where I didn't have any money to buy the other house with. So we finally got, we just, you know, but now I did the Jericho march. I anointed everything. This is my house in Jesus' name. I mean, we just went on, we did it all. You know, everything, everything you, every lever you've ever pulled and every button you've ever pushed and every technique you've ever tried, I did it. I know it's my house. The whole time something here going scratch. I wouldn't listen to the spirit of influence. So we went on a missions trip. Uh, <laughs> missions trip. It was a missions trip. We went to Europe. I preached in the Bible schools, and the family went with me on this particular trip. So we were, I forgot which one. I think it was our very first It was our very first one. So we had gone to Germany and gone to Paris. And, uh, and then back in the Germany, we preached in the German Bible school in Heidelberg. And uh, then drove over to Paris to see some uh, missionary friends over there. And we just rented a car and drove. It was just, you know, it's, it's, it's not that bad to drive around Europe. And uh, so we went and saw the, the Kilstroms there. They were in Paris. And we spent some time with them and drove back and flew back home. When we got home, we went to see the house, see how far they had come along. We walked in there. We had ordered all kinds of special stuff. Number one was flat ceilings. I don't like popcorn. And you might, have, you might love popcorn. I don't like popcorn. Because when you get a spider web or cobwebs and popcorn, you can't hardly get it all. It just tracks all across it, you know, that kind of stuff. And I wanted flat ceilings, you know. And then we'd ordered kitchen. We'd order our kitchen with, uh, we'd ordered uh, um, and, uh, bright white. We, you know, I don't know, you know, how many know that most houses, with they're building it and you're not sold and you're not paying, it's not paid for up front. They, put, they used to put antique white on everything. Antique white trimmed, glossy. Antique white, flat finish walls. Personally, I detest antique white. Hate it. Okay? Don't like it. It looks like, I just, you know, you may love it. I don't. You might like, you know, filet mignon. I might like uh, sirloin. I don't, I guess that's okay. It's a matter of taste. But we had ordered white, white throughout the house. Okay? I wanted white trim so I could come back and paint walls a different color and have that, that snap of a white trim. I, we like that way it looks. Like bright, bright white. Actually, with a little black in it. Two, two ounces of black per gallon gives it, just does something to it, gives it a real sharp. Benny, you probably know what I'm talking about. You know, putting a little black and white, it doesn't make sense, does it? But it makes, it makes white paint pop, 
Okay, it really does. And uh, so we come back, we order uh, special, uh, like certain color cabinets with a certain color cabinet top and a, and a different color floor. Come back in, and that kitchen looked like Mr. Clean. They had white countertops, white cabinets, white floor, popcorn ceilings, and um, antique white trim. I didn't have a Jericho march left. They want nothing too annoying. They're going to have to redo the whole house. You know? So we, you know, we got in this one, went and met with the, uh, the uh, realtor that was selling the house to us, that worked for the builder. And we said, what have they done? She said, well, you haven't sold your house yet. Now, listen, I've, done, I've been Jericho marching. I've been confessing. I've been declaring. Janelle Spencer, our realtor at the time, was going, you know, uh, you, got, you, you got to get on a pastor. We got to get, we're, we're speaking faith over that. You can speak all you want to, but if the spirit of influence is influencing you in a different direction, quit. You're just wasting your time. You are spitting in the wind. You pulled the mask off the old Lone Ranger. You put, you're tugging on Superman's cape, and you messed with Jim. You did them all. Some of, some of y'all remember that song? All right. You know, Jim Croce. Don't mess around with Jim. Of course, by the time Jim got done, he was messing around with Slim. It was Slim. Don't mess around with Slim anymore. All right. I mean, so we just said, we went to the realtor and said, we don't want it. Oh, it's still making nice. I don't want it. It's not, you've, you've, you've messed up everything we've asked for. So we went home, took our house off the market, and sat another year. A year later, we went back and revisited the house we had looked at, that we're in now, looked at to begin with. They had dropped the price $30,000. It was a better house, better neighborhood, more amenities. We have pool, tennis courts, stuff. The other neighborhood didn't have any of that. And bigger lots. Side loading instead of front loading garages makes the curb appeals nicer, better. All kinds of stuff. And uh, I'm telling you, we sold our house in 30 days or 40 days, whatever it was. I mean, we, 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 put, we put a bid in on that house with a contingency to sell ours, and we had it sold within, I think, 30. Somebody bought. And what happened was we, put, we were selling by owner. And um, we put a little thing out there, and this woman was sitting out in front of the house one day just in her car, and I ran out and I said, are you looking at our house? She said, I ride by and look at this house all the time. I want this house. She was from Rocky Mount. And we, we're from Greenville, so you know, we're close. And we had a wraparound farmhouse porch. It's an eight-foot in the front six. And she loved our porch. So I said, How? she said, well, there's no things you that. Hold on. I'll go get you one. They bought the house. They ended up buying the house. See, God wanted me in the other house to start with because that was, a, that was better for our family, what we need, more of what we had need of. It, it suited our needs much better than the house that we were going to settle for. And he was the whole time trying to influence me. So every time I'd try to pray, and I'd try, I declare that that's our house in Jesus' name, something would go, eh. Now I'm doing it. I'm, I'm listening to the tapes. Speak your faith. Declare the answer. But you see, when you go into prayer and the spirit of grace and supplication isn't influencing you in a direction and you're trying to make it go that way anyway, you're wasting your time. I said you're wasting your time. Your time, God's time, and whatever else time you invested in getting to that place you're trying to get to that God's, not, that God's pressing against you really on. That's why when we get into prayer, see, we have to, remember Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane and said this, and this isn't about everything in life. I mean, there's things in the Bible, you don't have to pray, if it be thy will, save me. God's already told you it's his will. It's not his will that any should perish. It's, you don't have to pray about him getting healed. You know, by his stripes, ye were healed. But there are things that you do in life that God leads and guides and directs. And God wants you to do that you don't have a scripture for. Amen. And so by his guidance, by the spirit of grace, as you enter into prayer, and, and, he, and you're trying to go a direction, and he starts pressing on you. I've had it happen. Now, when I was young, I was just stupid and wouldn't just run right over top of it. See, when you're young and dumb, you do young and dumb things. Now, you can learn from my experience without being stupid. I'm telling you, when you, go to, when you get into prayer about things, about, about guidance, about life, about direction, about possessions, about all kinds of things. Hallelujah. 
And he's, he's not connecting with you. So, so, uh, so Lynn asked, so what do I do? He said, he said you've got to find out what the will of God is and pray that way. He said, as long as you keep going this way, you're not going to make it. Because, see, you're trying to pray something out. You think it should be a certain way, but he's not hooking up with you. He's not pressing upon you. He's not getting involved with you. Amen? He's not being a part of it. Now, this, this family that was praying certain, something about, about their, their life and ministry, they, they knew they had God. People were, prophes- people were prophesying to them about their move, how glorious it was going to be. The Lord has showed me. The Lord ain't showed you doodly squat. How do you know? Because it won't God's will. How do you know? They came to it themselves when they got to a certain place and God moved in a way and, and it opened, their eyes opened. They went, oh, well, that was the wrong thing, wasn't it? All along. But I pray, and, and they actually testified and confessed. I prayed this so far in this direction, I couldn't let it go. That's what they said. See, that's what, they that are led by the Spirit of God, say they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. See, when we learn to let him influence where and how we're praying. Now, listen, folks, I, I know this. I understand this, that you don't need to pray about getting saved. Lord, you know, if you sure will, save me, show me. You, know, it's not, you don't need to pray about getting healed. Now, he, you may need, need to pray about, pray about you know, um, uh, Lord, which path do you want me to take? Okay? Amen. Other than that, though, you don't have to pray about the fact that God wants you well. He already tell, he's already told you. You don't have to pray about him wanting to prosper you. He's already told you. Amen. But when the Spirit of God presses upon you, and, and, or listen, remember he takes hold together with against your infirmities? What if you're moving something and you're expecting him to help and he ain't helping? Then stop. Now, if I'm being there to move in that dresser, or the chest of drawers, and, 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 I, and all of a sudden, I'm just like, I've got all the weight. Buddy, where are you? Nate, where are you, buddy? I'm sitting down. Why are you sitting down? Because you're about to push me down the steps, and I ain't going. Really? See, we're not working together anymore, and all of a sudden, I got all the weight on me. And we end up that way sometimes in prayer. We get all the weight on us, and God's not working with us. The Holy Spirit's not helping us. He's not involved. Now, he's trying to press you in another direction, but you keep going being hard-headed. Like that saying is, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. All right? If you're going to be dumb, you've got to be tough. Why? Because if you're going to be dumb, you're going to encounter some stuff where you need to be tough. Yeah, I told my, my, my son for years had a cast on the wall. And he wrote under a sign there, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Why? Because daddy told him never go rollerblading without your wrist guards, your elbow pads, knee pads, and your helmet on. He came home one day, grabbed his rollerblades, ran, he's 11, 12, well, about to turn 12, whatever, ran over to the park, and we have a slide at our park, and his, his buddies well, I want him to roll a blade down the slide and catch air. And he did, several times. And every time he'd do it, they said, do it again, Nathan. <laughs> like I said, you're going to be dumb. You're okay. Well, the last time, obviously, he did it. And when he went to, go, when he went to catch air, the back brake caught the thing, threw his feet out, came, he threw his arm down to catch himself. And when he did, broke his wrist in two places. One was a complete fracture, the other was a green stick fracture. The next day was the uh, championship game for the Little League playoffs in High Point. Nathan wasn't playing. He, so he comes home, opens, you know, knocks on the back door, opened up, he's in his rollerblade, says, I think I broke my wrist, and I grab him. I know you didn't, buddy. He passes out. I guess you did. <laughs> so after he got his cast off, <laughs> that's my story. It's a story time with Big Dog. I just barely touched. No, I did. I just kind of grabbed it and said, you're not broke. Yeah, it was. 
<laughs> yeah, he, he, boom, he was out. So when he got that cast off, he, he, took, he took push pins and put it on his wall and put a sign. If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Why? Because I told him, don't go rollerblading without your guards on. If he had his wrist guards on, he, he may have sprained something or whatever, but he wouldn't have broke it. Of course, the other thing is you don't rollerblade down a slide. But that's common sense help there. That's just, I, hadn't thought, I didn't think I needed to tell him don't roll the blade down the slide. Okay? But he resisted my wisdom in that moment and time in his life. And it cost. And see, the, remember, the spirit of God is not only the spirit of grace, but he's the spirit of wisdom. And when he presses upon us, there's wisdom in the spirit there. He's trying to get across to us. His, his grace, his influence is pressing upon us. To deliver God's wisdom. And if we resist that, let's go get your sign out. Hang it up in your prayer closet. If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. I've seen many, 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 many people make errors in their walk. Because I prayed this out. Really? Really? And it's God. Brother Hagen, and another Brother Hagin story. Can we finish with this Brother Hagin story? Had a woman, he was in a church, had a woman in his church. And a uh, good Christian woman, a little bit older, you know, good Christian woman, loved the Lord. And uh, came to a Brother Hagin and said, well, I'm getting married. Well, who are you getting married to? Well, I'm getting married to so-and-so. Well, what do you know about him? Well, he's a good man. Yeah, he's a good man. What, may, what makes a good man? Well, back in those days, if he, if he had a job, he's going to take care of you, whatever, treat you nice, whatever. They thought, well, but, and, and, and uh, and uh, said, now he drinks a little bit. He keeps a little beer in the fridge. But he said he'll stop drinking for me. Are you women that stupid? If they tell you they'll stop doing something for you, it's usually for you until. What do you mean until? Until you get married. When you get married, they change it. If they said they stop doing Whatever, until, until, it is until you get married, and then they're going to change whatever it was they weren't doing. So what happened was this woman, he, he tried to say, look, you, you're serving the Lord, you're, filled, you're born again, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he isn't. You know, you told me he drinks. You know, kind of went on and on and on and on. Finally, finally got around to it, and uh, she went off and married him anyway. Well, in the meantime, he had, uh, he had uh, changed pastorates. In other words, in other words he had, he had uh, taken a pastor in another city about 15, 20 miles away. And uh, so he had left. And, they were, and, they, and him and Sister Rita had gone over there, and they were moving in. They're still kind of unpacking. You know, if you move, it takes a little while to unpack. You don't unpack the same day that you've got 60 people helping you. Okay? You just kind of unpack and go, go through and set everything up. And so they're they kind of take, taking a break and sat on the front porch and looked down and said, saw this woman walking down the street. It had been about three or four weeks since they had been at the other church. And said, so this, this woman's walking down the street like this. And they said, well, isn't that sister so-and-so? And the closer she got, they said, well, yeah, it's her. And, and of course, you know how the old, a lot of the old cities, they had little front fences, little picket fences with a little gate and stuff. And so she got closer and closer to the house. And the closer she got, when she could see them make eye contact, and she says, I want you to tell me one thing. I want you to tell me one thing. And we look, look at her, and she's like an old woman, been, you know, beat up. And, I mean, what well, she had. She said, she finally opened the gate and went, how come God put him off on me? And then she, and she went and said, you know, they found out that, you know, uh, about, they got married about two weeks after they got married, that, uh, you know, he had gone out drinking after work. Remember, he told us he was going to give it up for her. Now, if you ladies believe that, I have got oceanfront real estate in Colorado I'd like to sell you this afternoon at a great rate. Okay? Because they'll tell you anything. And uh, he, said, he said he came home from work. He got, stopped by, got something, got drinking, came home. She said something he didn't like. He jumped on and nearby about beat her to death. She spent a, a, almost two weeks in the hospital. I want to know how come God put him off on me. Brother Hagin said, God didn't put him off on you. You were the old geek and you got him. Now, he said this. He said she did, she did finally pray him into the kingdom and get him saved, but he's well convinced it took 10 years off her life. You can't live that way. So you can't live that way. See, if you listen to the Holy Ghost, we never got there in the first place. I said, listen to the Holy Ghost when you got there in the first place. 
when he went, she went to praying about it. See, sometimes, and I don't even believe she was praying about it. Your flesh get involved, and you just don't, you, you know, you call it prayer. It ain't prayer. This, listen, this is not just about relationships. This is about jobs. I've seen see people take jobs that they shouldn't have taken because it was more money, but it took the family out of church, took them out of the people who had good influence in their life that were blessings to them. We don't need to make those kind of mistakes. And the Holy Ghost will keep you from making those mistakes if you'll listen to his influence. I say, if you'll listen to his influence, how come God put him off on me? God didn't. You wanted him, you got him. Hello? There's some, you know, there's some jobs in life you don't need. It's $10,000 a year more money. That's got to be God. Well, I've been praying about prosperity, and I got this job opportunity for $10,000 a year more. And what you don't know is in two years, that company is going to sell, and, you're gonna get, and they're going to sell to another company, and they're going to absorb it, and all the, those people from the other company are going to lose their jobs. So you made $20,000 extra, dollars, but then you lost $60,000 a year after that. So you don't see there's things we don't know, but the Spirit does. There are things ahead that the Holy Ghost knows. Isn't that right, Brother Benny? That the Holy Ghost knows that we don't know. That if we'll, if we'll listen to the Spirit, he'll, he'll cause us to avoid the entrapments of the devil. Now, do you think the devil's going to provide you with the opportunity for a job paying half? And so you're running, whoa, it's the Lord. I got a job opportunity to make it half. I'm not saying just because you got a job opportunity is wrong, but you know what? There's other things to consider other than the money. What are they going to expect out of you? What kind of time? How are you, how are you going to be able to? Are you going to be able to spend the time with your family that your children need, that your wife needs? Are you going to be able to stay in your church? Have you got to move? You got to travel a bunch and not be, but not be at, at, at church anymore, where you get fed and get ministered to. Well, I can't. You know, it's so much money I can't pass it up. But I won't be in church anymore, Pastor, because I got I got to be gone on weekends. I got to work Wednesday nights. So you can't be in church. No, but, you know, praise God, I'll be tithing. Yeah, right. Like one pastor just said, he said, people love virtual churches so they can give their virtual offerings. <laughs> Hello? I watch church on the Internet, and they, don't, and they ain't sending money nowhere. That went over big. Amen. I said amen. So you would listen to God. The spirit of grace will come on us and he'll, he'll cause us to pray and supplicate. But I, I'm just, I kind of got over this. He'll help us. We have to learn to yield to the wisdom of the Holy Ghost and his influence upon us, even in prayer. So that we pray out in accordance with God's will. And get God answers. I want God answers. I don't want Ed answers. I already know what I know. Did y'all get that? You already know what you know. And there's cases and circumstances in life where I don't need what I know and I don't need what you know. I need what God knows. And I go to pray and I'm praying out what I know about it. You know, have you ever tried to talk to somebody? And I, I, as a pastor, I counsel people. I told you I was going to quit, but I haven't. They had too much fun this morning. But you ever try to talk to people? I do this all the time. I try to talk to them and, I, and I'll start to say, well, you know, um, or I'll say, you know, well, look, the Bible says it. Yeah, I know that, but. And they go and tell you what they think. And I'm thinking, but you already know what you know. I've got wisdom from heaven. I can show you from the word of God that a way to help you and bring you a benefit and keep you from messing up all over the place. But here you are being hard. And every time I open my mouth, all I get out of you is I know. And then, and then, you, work, then you run on and spout your mouth. I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying to give you counsel here. Yeah, I know that, but. And they go on. So you know what I end up doing? You know what I'm thinking? Go ahead, dummy. I'm sitting here with answers from heaven. And all you got to do is say, all you keep telling me is what you know. And obviously, what you know ain't working because you look at you. If you would shut up and listen to the words, and a lot of times we go to God that same way. We go in and tell God how we got it all figured out and fixed out and then walk out thinking he blessed it. And if you would have just shut up and said, Lord, show me what you know about this. You might hear something that would totally radically change your life and fix everything. Don't get too happy. I mean, that's that, that is enough wisdom to run around the church over. 
And since there's no cables on the floor anymore, you won't trip. Glory to God. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.